Fenton and I'm an aeromodeler and an engineer. Join me on a fascinating journey where I show you some of the techniques used in scale aeromodeling. Hello again modelers. Well I've been away for a while, well not been videoing for a while, I wasn't feeling very well. Covid uh, got me and the wife and we uh, we had a bit of a struggle but um, <clears throat> we're all okay now I'm glad to be back. Um, I'm running out of ideas for detailing on these videos so I'm just going to continue on with the the build of the model um, because there seems to be general interest in in how it goes. So today I'm going to I'm going to cover the struts uh, and how I've made the struts. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm also going to look at the bracing wires that are on the rear tailplane and fin. These are structural on this model um, because of the way I've cut the tailplane in half and joined with carbon tunes, tubes. It needs the bracing wires to actually be strong enough. So what we'll start with is looking at uh, normal soldering of some nuts onto the back of some steel plates. And then you'll see how these uh, plated sections are used to join the um, struts together and um, to sort all of that out. OK, so that's what's in store for you in this video. Back on the theme of not wishing to teach you to suck eggs, I'm just going to do a bit of this is uh, soft soldering. And what I've got for this is um, some uh, some very nice solder. And if you uh, really want to make the best joints, you need um, a silver content, uh, you know, a high silver um, percentage in your solder. And this has got a 2% two, two silver in it. It's expensive, but when you uh, use it, you end up with the, a really glossy uh, silver flow over the top of your wiring and stuff. And because I mainly fly electrics, the uh, resistance of my connectors and contacts and stuff has to be good. So silver, high silver content in the solder is the answer. Okay. The other thing I'm using here is a Weller 120 watt iron and it's a big, big beastie. Um, I've been through a few tips um, till I found one that actually doesn't just dissolve. So, um, and then we've got a sponge pad for cleaning it and I've got a, an arm for holding the part. And what we've got here is um, the main anchor point that goes from the base of the strut to the fuselage around where the um, undercarriage anchorage point is. So it's a strong point on the fuselage. So this is going to take the full lifting loads. So it has to be quite secure. This is a piece of mild steel about, gosh, I don't know, two million, um, one and a half millimeters thick, I suppose. So what I'm going to try and do is solder that M2 nut, which I've cleaned and the metal has been cleaned too. I'm going to try and solder that nut to that metal. Let's see how we get on. Eh? It's trying to go. And I think that's probably going to be as good as we're going to get. The The problem is the metal plate didn't seem to really want to get hot, but that looks like it's, um, it's flowing nicely. Okay. But it did look like it wasn't um, wasn't clean enough, so maybe we actually needed to add an acid acid flux to this before we proceeded. I might try that on the other side because obviously I've got two of these to do, and we'll see if it's any better. Just seeing if the um, screw releases. I've never had to do anything to stop the screw actually soldering to the. Um, plate before. But maybe when this is a first. Oh, 
Now, there we go. So the screw is coming out, coming off. It's um, probably got some flux from the solder in the thread, which is making it a little bit stiff. That'll clean up. Ah, but see what's happened? It's immediately come off. So that makes me, looking at the surface of that, and that makes me think that the, the nut was the guilty party, which I'm a bit surprised about because I really did clean that. Okay, so we'll think again. So we'll give it another go. I've cleaned it all up again. This time I'm using some Powercraft flux, soft solder flux. So I'm just going to put a little bit around. It's not really going on very well. And something maybe sharper than a, the end of a drill bit. Oh, that's going on there. I've never used flux like this because all of the um, solders I've used have all had an internal flux. So. so this is new ground for me. Right, <clears throat> so nice and clean. Got this flux on it. Iron's hot. Let's see how we go. Good sign, the flux has melted straight away, and you can see it bubbling profusely. That's gone beautifully silver straight away. So, I think that kind of proves it. You can see how shiny the solder is. This is this high silver content solder. Cleanliness is obviously key, and adding the flux to that has obviously made it um, really clean, so it's it's taken straight away. Okay, I'll, I'll wait for that to cool down, clean it all off a little bit, and then we'll see how strong it is. So the screw has come out without too much effort, and as you can see, or I hope you can see, we've got a good flow all around the steel and the nut. So I think we're into... Um, Good territory there. I think that's a, it's a nice solid joint. If you hadn't already guessed, we're working on the struts. So, as you can see here, the, the struts were made are made of spruce. And they were originally square section. There is a notch cut in the end. Um, and on the, uh, on the model, you're supposed to use uh, polycarbonate. So... They were thinking that they'd use a, a piece of polycarbonate plastic with a flange on it and a hole in it to mount this. Uh, but I've heard from other modelers that say that the polycarbonate actually um, gets brittle with age and next thing you know they, they snap. So I'm going to actually use steel and it slots in there nicely. So I'm going to just simply replace the polycarbonate with steel, mild steel, and It'll be like that, all epoxied, and then on the other side, you've just seen me solder the nut. So what I need to do next is mark out exactly what I need of that. And I just need a bit around the nut. What I think I'll do is I'll just straight line these sides, radius the end around the nut. So I think that will probably do it. If I find somebody to actually write on this metal, that would uh, really be good. So, see if we can extend that line a bit, like straight, that line straight, and then just radius it off, kind of like that. I think that should do us. Okay, I'll cut that, and then I'll be right back. Well, after a sequence of files and uh, cutting, I think I have what we need. So these two ends, these two bits of wood, as you as you saw in the uh, previous example, were square spruce. They've now been rounded off. Um, it's horrible stuff to round off because because of the grain, the sandpaper cuts some bits much better than other bits, and that's um, disappointing. So that will go in there like that, all the way in there, like that. And 
and uh, that will get epoxied just like that. And then on the back side, as you saw, there's a nut. If we come over to the model, you can see that uh, I've actually assembled it upside down. There. In there like that. Those two go to the nice and parallel and level. And then that simply goes underneath that, like that. And then a screw goes in from this side. Now I have a feeling that screw is going to be very difficult to do up. But I can't see another way of quickly doing this. Because um, I think the undercarriage is going to get in the way. I'll see if I've got an M2, which is the size of the screw, an M2 um, Allen head screw, because that'll be easier to do at an angle. I've got some ball joint sockets, so I'll see if that works. You'll see that the, um, the ends of the struts will also need metal plates attaching with an angle on and holes drilled in. And they go into these blind nuts, which are actually built into the, into the wing, into plywood plates. So most of the load, the lifting load of this model is through the struts. Okay, so I'll make up these plates to go in the end of these. They just need metal strips with an angle with holes in the end, and that should do it. Okay, so we've moved along a little bit from the uh, strut ends, and they're all created and uh, uh, epoxied in. I've also gone a little bit further than that. Um, let's try this end. You should be able to see from this or here, that I've also drilled all the way through the hardwood, through the steel plate, and pinned with two solid carbon rods. Here you can see I've used a an M3, four millimeter long um, mushroom headed Allen key screw. These are from Model Fixings, uh, an excellent supplier in the UK. I can't really tell you where else uh, to get them but um, they are an excellent company to deal with so you can see the struts are now done and uh, they stiffen up the wing substantially because the uh, the steel rods that the wing slides onto are great for um, you know location but they the wings actually sag down uh, just under weight so they don't really do a lot the struts do all the work so once these are on, it's really rigid, and I've built in about one and a half degrees, which looks about right, of, um, of dihedral. So from the back, it doesn't really look obvious. It's not until you actually get everything all lined up that you see that the wings have a slight amount of dihedral in. Excuse me. So, so that's pretty good. So what I've done with these is I've, um, I've bound the areas where the, uh, the clips are, are holding the interplane struts. Um, with carpet thread, it's actually crochet thread. So, um, and then the whole lot has just been given in a coat of LS285 resin, which is usually used with glass cloth, but in this case, I've just put it straight onto the hardwood. It's a bit rough at the moment, uh, and I, I only did it yesterday, and I like to give it a good 24 hours of hardening before I go near it with sandpaper. So that's the next step is to sand these, but I think what we'll do now is while we're waiting for these to dry is we'll take a look at the the rigging that goes between the fin and the tailplane and the bottom of the fuselage. This gives a lot of rigidity to the whole tail section and keeps it straight. I've also got a very slight lean on the on the fin which I'm hoping I can correct with the rigging wires. I'm going to use the Mick Reeves wires which I've already shown a video on how to how to silver solder those but I'll show it again because it's fairly straightforward. All right, so let's get cracking. One of the first things we need to do is drill a hole through these hard points that I produced or built into the fin. They are also not so much hard points, but they're also to be drilled just here. It's right on a rib tape, a bit unfortunate.
What I'm using to um, attach these brackets are these small brass plates. Now they're just they're just cut out of brass. Um, and I've drilled two holes and then I put a bend in it with a pair of pliers. I try to make these as small as I can but still be strong because it looks wrong on a model when you see these great big fittings. So this is what I've done. So they will go through that hole, like that, angled towards that slightly, and then on the other side, which you can't really see, so I'll do it the other way around, because it makes no odds. So that you can see me struggle like crazy with the screw on this side. Now these, these two holes are not the same size. They're a fraction of a millimetre different, so that I get a good snug fit on the Mick Reeves uh, fitting, end fitting, and also I get a good snug fit on this 10BA screw. So let's see if I can actually thread the nut onto this. I will be amazed. Oh my goodness, I have. Now, I won't do these up till properly until later, but uh, I can pinch them up at least with my fingers. Well, I can try. I'm going to go to screwdriver. That should suffice for what we need right now. The end of the screw. I will saw off once we're once we're happy, but if I shorten it now, it'll make putting that nut on really difficult. So it's better to do all this and then cut that off. What I'll also do is I'll put thin zap in there once it's all done up and glue the threads so that um, they can come undone, but it won't come undone undone easily. I'll have to force it, uh, but hopefully they should not have to come undone ever. Now, one thing that does concern me a little bit there is the angle at which I've cut that, I've bent that. That's actually very good on that side. And it's very good on that side too, so I shan't worry about that too much. So what we have to do next is go and get a fitting and fit it on there. See what we get, see what it looks like. Just start the screw off, but not enough to actually block the clevis. And that goes on there. And then that screw gets done up. Should go through the uh, copper plate or the brass plate into the clevis on the other side. And there we have it. Okay, so now what we have to do is do the same down on the tail plane, create a bracket. And once we've got those clevises on, then we can thread the little inserts into this, both ends, and measure out how long the wire is going to be. I know I've shown you these before, but I'll show you again. There are two types of fitting. This one has a circular end in it and it allows you to slide this adjuster screw in there and the head fits through that adjuster, uh, through the clevis. That one will just spin. Okay, And then on the end of that, before you do anything else, you fit the lock nut, because you can't do this afterwards. The lock nut just stops it, as, as you would imagine, stops it from spinning once you've adjusted the length. So there is the fitting. And what I do also, before I go any further, is I attach the screw, holding it to the end of my screwdriver, with my fingernail and then I just start the screw in the fitting just so it catches it makes life a lot easier okay and that end is done now that's the free spinning end the other end which is not one of those 
does not have a hole in the middle. And for this one, you have a rod that you thread into. Okay, and this is the one that actually shortens and lengthens the rope, uh, lengthens the wires, the rigging wires. But before you fit that, don't forget the locking nut. So the locking nut goes on next. I hope you can see all this. It's really difficult to do on camera. So you'll see one end of this thing has got a head on it, and the other end is just threads. So in this case, we just thread the bolt, screw, whatever you want to call it, into the fitting and it will stop. It'll hit the end. Now what I do is I put the nut up to the end and then I back off, making sure the nut doesn't move, about 5 mil. Okay, then I do up the nut again. That should give me 3 mil travel in and out of that fitting. Okay, then what we have are two fittings. One that will just swivel and one that will shorten. And what we do is we silver solder some steel, stainless steel rod, either piano wire or whatever you fancy using, um, in between those of exactly the right length. What Mick Reeves sells in his kit is this. And this is stainless steel flat wire. And it's great for rigging. It's great for rigging. It's, it's not airfoil section, which is what it should be. Um, but, it, but it looks good. I've used piano wire as well if I've wanted a round section. Um, and these rods on the tail of the Oster are probably round. I'll go and do some research. If they're round, I'll use piano wire. If they're flat, then I'll use some of this. And then we'll do some silver soldering. Okay, I've shown this before, shown this process before. These are the Mick Reeves fork ends. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to solder, silver solder them together to make a one piece. Uh, these have been fitted to the model in the right place. And then this piece of piano wire is measured to be exactly the right distance. So what will happen if I fit this, then there's plenty of thread to shorten it, but not really lengthen it. So you make sure it's the right length. Okay, so... What we do, and I have shown this before, I'm, well I know I have, I've produced a video on this um, before now. So what we need is some silver solder. This is actually silver solder wire, 55% silver, 0.7mm diameter, 6 inch coil, uh, 6 foot coil. This 6 foot length cost me about 10 quid, so it's not cheap stuff, but it's good. If you get the right stuff, the job's much easier. You need a flux. And this is a borax powder type flux that I'm using. And so here we go. What you do, take your fork end, take the end that you're going to silver solder, lick it, dip it in the borax so you've got a blob. Okay, clamp it across this round bit. Don't clamp across the fork, otherwise you could compress it. Now this is all going to happen very quickly, so just keep an eye on it. And there you hope you can see that there's a blob of solder now formed on the end of the at the end of the um, fork end. It's hot. Don't forget, it's hot. The other one, the other end, lick, borax, in the clamp. I think I was aiming a little bit low on that one, which is why it took a little bit longer to, to kick, but it did eventually. That's the other one. Now what we have to do is the we have to tin the ends of the piano wire. Again, lick some borax powder on the end, and away we go again.
now as you see that got red hot I was trying to avoid that if it gets red hot it's it um, softens the metal so I was trying to avoid that but with such a thin gauge of piano wire it's very difficult not to lick the end into the borax light the flame was better. Okay so now it's two ends tinned and the solder tinned. So what we do now simply put the end into the clamp And there you go, that's one end done. Just as easy as that. It's hot, remember. Other end into the clamp. It moved at the wrong moment then. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm just going to heat that and add a bit of solder to it. I may have to dismantle it, clean it and, and redo it. We'll have to see. It's a good, um, good demonstration though. I've never had one do that before. So. Yeah, as you can see, I wasn't happy with that, and it was going red hot as well, which, uh, which is not good. If this doesn't work, I'll just abandon it and make another one. That looks better. It's a bit of a big blob. And that doesn't really matter too much. Right. Secret, don't let it move till it's fully set. Well, as you can see, rather annoyingly, <laughs> it clicked in the crocodile clip at the last minute. But actually, it's it's got a slight wave in it, but it's not too bad. The other end you can see is reasonably straight. And this is all just down to your eyeball. Um, but there you go. That's the two ends made. Here you can see I've cut away some of the plywood base underneath the stone of the fuselage. Notched it. Then I've taken a piece of brass plate, made it into that sort of shape and bent the ends over. A very tiny countersunk Phillips screw is holding that in place, although the tension on the wires will hold it in place, but that just makes doubly sure. Hopefully you can see 
that uh, all the fittings are now done, two silver solder joints, and this end is the free end, so if I undo that lock nut, this end will just rotate. Undo the lock nut here, well you have to undo both obviously, undo this one, this will actually thread into that um, horn, into that um, fork end, so you can actually shorten it, and I've done it, so there's a little bit of tension. But I don't want to put too much on there yet because uh, there's nothing pulling on the other side. So now we flip it over and we'll do the other two uh, rods for the other side. And as you can see, the rigging wires are done and they're taut enough. And the whole tailplane is now much more rigid. Uh, I've also managed to pull this fin over couple of millimeters that way with this one being a little bit more tension than this one um, and it's pulled it over a bit which is perfect okay so I hope you found that interesting uh, and I'm sorry there's been a bit of a delay between the last video and this one if you've enjoyed the video then please subscribe and click like and uh, I'll see you on the next one